Um, so, listen, we, um, uh, people have asked me, did I have a good trip? Um, I, I appreciate Alan preaching while I was gone, but I heard that, again, we were looking at, it was just too short. Um, couldn't get anything out of it because it was too short. I'm going to have to talk to these guys that fill in. They're going to have to either get a little bit longer or they're not getting paid. As <laughs> get paid by the minute here. So people have asked me, did, did you have a good trip? I'm glad to be home. I hate traveling. I don't, I don't like going. It's been a long time since I've been uh, on, on one of these uh, retreats like this. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I flew three times I, from here. I mean, I went from here to Denver, then coming back, Denver to Houston, Houston to Jacksonville. And I got the last seat in the plane every time, <clears throat> the very back seat that does not recline at all, and where the stewardess knocks your arm the whole night long. Uh, but we did have a good time there, and it wasn't a bad place to be. I'll show you a couple of our sites that we had. That was from where we were uh, at the retreat. So that's uh, kind of what we were looking at. And then uh, one morning we got to see, uh, that's upside down, sideways. <laughs> go to the next one for me. There's the next one. Oh, there you go. Uh, so that was right outside. So it was a beautiful place. It was way too cold, as you could see. Uh, it was funny, too, because when I got there on Thursday, it started snowing a little bit. And I said, it's cold. And they go, no, no, this is normal. And I said, listen, I was on the beach on Monday morning in Florida. This is not my idea of fun. So very good. All right, so what we're going to do is uh, continue in our year-long sermon series of God using ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And when I say year long, all it means is that at times I'm going to come back and touch on this sermon series uh, throughout the year. So starting next week, I'm going to begin a sermon series out of 1 Thessalonians. would encourage you this week to read through that a couple times. When I finish that sermon series, we'll probably come back to this one for a couple sermons. But, um, so I want to kind of continue on this morning. I want to look at Peter. Uh, Peter's a very ordinary guy. He was a fisherman. Uh, we don't know very much more about that. I mean, he didn't seem to be wealthy in any sense. He was married. Um, he got along with his uh, mother-in-law, which that might have been extraordinary. But anyway, uh, he had a mother-in-law that he seemed to care about. Um, he was like a lot of us. His uh, words got ahead of his mind sometimes. He just blurted things out. He at times could be a little bit hot-headed. And yet God was able to use him in some extraordinary ways. And I want to look at those this morning. About 15 years ago, I think, maybe a little bit longer than that, uh, Lisa and I lived in Durham, North Carolina. <clears throat> we moved from an apartment to a um, little old house. And when I say little, it was little. And when I say old, it was old. But we moved there because it had a big yard, and our kids, our girls, were... Uh, you know, needed that time to be out. They, they enjoyed the yard. Well, one day I go home for lunch. Lisa's not there. I go in, make myself a sandwich, and uh, I leave to go back to work. I had an appointment. It was a pretty important appointment, I remember. And I, I got in the car, and I realized at that point I'd locked my keys in the house. Well, there are no cell phones. Uh, there's no way to contact anybody. I'm stranded there. I know i got to get back to this appointment. So I decided to see if there was some way that I could get into the house. So <clears throat> I walked around, and the bathroom window, which was a small bathroom and a small window, was unlocked. Now, it was one of these double-pane old windows. And so I, I moved it to where I could get it up, and then I climbed through that window and fell into the bathroom. I turned around <clears throat> to shut the window, and I grabbed it to pull it down, but wouldn't pull because, one, it was old. It was a very old house. Uh, wood had warped. And plus, I wasn't nearly as big as I am now, but I was too big to go through that window, so I had shoved it on up there pretty hard. So I grabbed it, and I pulled it down as hard as I could, and my fingers got stuck in between the windows. I was stuck there. What am I going to do? There's no one to holler for. It's a small house, but there's no one to hear me. So I moved this one free, Lift it up, pull this one out, and those six fingers had been smashed. Uh, pain was so great, but I had to go on in and do what I needed to do. The next day, I began to notice the nails getting black because the blood is forming behind the nails and put the pressure on there. Now, my dad, I didn't realize this about my dad. I guess I did then, but the more I think about it, he was a man's man because whenever he would smash his finger and the blood would get there, he'd get his case knife out and he would drill, dig down through that nail until he got to the blood and it would come up. 
Well, I tried that. <laughs> it hurt to touch it, much less drilling it. I don't get the idea what my dad's doing. I, I, all day long, I oh, try, I couldn't do it. So I go to the doctor the next day, and, and I, I said, can we fix it? He goes, yeah, not a problem. I said, well, what are we going to do? And he said, well, I'm going to take this paper clip, and I'm going to heat it up, and I'm going to lay it on that nail till it goes down there and releases the blood. And this is what went through my mind. Stupid keys. I hate keys. I hate them dumb keys. If we didn't need keys, we wouldn't have to have this problem. The interesting thing is keys can be kind of a problem at times, can't they? You get way too many on your keychain. You lose them. You place them. You drive somewhere, and the key you need isn't there. And yet we know that there is an importance to keys. They open things. They open homes. They open cars. They open safety deposit box. Now, the reason I share that with you is because the extraordinary thing in Peter's life that I want you to see is that Jesus gave him a set of keys one time. And those keys are really, really important for us. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to give you the event of where these keys were given to Peter. And we're going to walk through this, just share some things. I'm not going to spend, a, I hope, a whole bunch of time here, but there's just some interesting things in this particular event. <clears throat> and then I want us to see these keys in action because they're the center point of this uh, uh, of this text. So we're in Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to begin with, that, uh, with, with verse 13, and just walk through these verses for a few minutes, so just kind of stay with me. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, why do people say, or who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, we don't know why Jesus asked this question at this time and in this place. Uh, this, this wasn't anywhere near Jerusalem, and um, uh, it wasn't a really <laughs> exciting place. Um, and we're not sure why he asked the question right now when he did. My opinion is this. Um, it's not going to be long before uh, Jesus goes into warp speed when it comes to the cross. And I think at this point he needed to know, is anybody getting it? Is anybody catching what I'm teaching here? Are people grasping what I'm trying to communicate when it comes to the Messiah and what I am going to do? And so he asked the question. Who do men say that I am? Verse 14, they replied, some say John the Baptist, other Elijah, so others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now three are specifically mentioned here of who people say Jesus is. It's interesting to know maybe why they, they said these three. John the Baptist, why John the Baptist? There was a rumor that had started that Jesus was John the Baptist that had been brought back from the dead. Does anybody know who started that rumor? I do. According to chapter 14 of Matthew, verse 1, it was, it was uh, Herod, uh, the one that had put John the Baptist to death. He saw Jesus performing this miracle, and he said, is this John the Baptist that had come back from the dead? And that rumor began to spread that people thought that. Why Elijah? Well, that's pretty easy. According to Malachi, there was a prophecy that Elijah would precede the Messiah. And so many thought that Jesus was Elijah preceding the Messiah. Now, us having hindsight... We know that it was John the Baptist that was Elijah preceding the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And then there's Jeremiah. Why Jeremiah? No one knows for sure why people thought Jesus was Jeremiah. He was a great prophet, but I don't know if he was greater than any of the other ones. Some believe because Jeremiah's ministry and Jesus' ministry was very similar. Uh, Jeremiah's ministry was one of authority. It was one of suffering. It was one of doom. And if you look at Jesus' ministry, all three of those things were there as well. But there might be another reason. There was a belief that right before Babylon took Israel, or Judah in essence, into captivity, they believed that Jeremiah took the Ark of the Covenant and the altar of incense and hid it. And the Jews believed, many of the Jews believed, that Jeremiah would come back with the Ark and the altar preceding the Messiah. I don't know for sure, but it was those three that were mentioned. Jesus then turns, verse 15, but what about you? Now, that word you is very interesting, folks. It's plural. He's asking all of the disciples there, the apostles. But what about you, he said? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, understand that word you is very important to understanding the rest of this passage. Because Peter was being just a spokesperson here. 
I don't believe Peter was the only one of the 12 that believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was speaking for them. Jesus said, well, who do you, who, who, all of you, what do you, who do you think I am, guys? And Peter just spoke up. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's not unusual. A couple weeks ago, we looked at the death of Lazarus. And if you remember, when Jesus got the news that Lazarus was sick, he waited two days. Then he decided to go. And when he decided to go, the apostles were going, wait a minute, we're not going back there. They tried to kill you when you were back there before. And he said, we got to go. And Thomas, as a spokesman, said, let's go, guys. Let's go and die with him. So it wasn't unusual for one to speak for the rest. I believe that all of them believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of living God. What is he saying here? You are the Messiah. You are the one sent by God. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. You are the anointed one. You're the one God has sent to save us, to redeem us, to, to take us out of captivity. They were getting it. Look, Peter didn't get it right a lot of times. He got it right this time. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Now, sometimes we get bent out of shape because of this. This is some miraculous thing that God gave to Peter. No, 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 no. Look, Jesus is saying, you didn't get this because you were logical. Because, folks, listen to me. If you want to follow Christ based on logic, you will never follow him based on logic. It's not possible. Let me show you why. Take a look at a uh, passage out of Corinthians. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Look, when you look at the fact that God came to this earth and died by the hands of men that didn't like him, there's no way you believe he's God. That doesn't even make any logical sense. You see, Peter, God revealed to Peter who Jesus was because Peter was open spiritually to understanding who Jesus was. And that's the key for anybody to follow Christ. Peter put away some of his preconceived notions and his prejudice about things in order to be able to follow Christ. And the fact of the matter is, that's the same for every person in this room today. You'll never follow Christ if you hold on to preconceived ideas of things that you've been taught or you believe to be true. And I'm not saying they're not true. But if you're holding on to those things where you ignore what God is trying to teach you spiritually, you will never follow him. And I'm going to tell you where I see it the greatest. I can't do that because it will offend my parents or my grandparents or my great-grandparents. And all of a sudden, you make a decision not to do what God calls you to do because of a prejudice or a preconceived ideas, and God is not able to reveal to you the truth. He was to Peter because Peter was open spiritually to knowing who Christ was. He was the Messiah, the Son of God. Keep going, verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I'll give you the keys. Here they are. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was a Christ. Now, this passage is tough. A lot of debate over it. The Catholic Church is convinced because of this phrase, you are Peter, and I'm going to build my church on this rock that it's talking about building the church upon Peter as the foundation. It's really nothing more than a play on words. If you look at that verse again, the word for Peter is Petros, and the word for rock is Petra. So it's, it's kind of just a play on word. And I tell you that you are Petros, and on this Petra, I will build my church. But there are people that believe that Peter is the rock that the church is built upon. So much so that they believe that Peter had the power to either absolve or not absolve someone from their sin. That he became the first bishop of the church and that that power to absolve or not absolve someone from sin was passed on to all the bishops and that even the Pope has that power today. Now, if you look at that verse, there is some logic to it. Peter, upon this rock, and your name is Peter, I'm going to build the church. Unless you look at all the scriptures. Because you see, there was someone else in Scripture that is called the Rock. That was just a nickname for Peter. But there was actually one that was called the Rock. Not, not Dwayne Johnson, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> but someone called the Rock. Look, if you would, at Deuteronomy chapter 32. He is the Rock. 
His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just as he. You see, God is called the rock. He's referred to that in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 2 and in 2 Samuel chapter 22. Christ is the rock. Go back to my outline for a minute, Carla. I want you to throw up my three principles. Go, go back a, a little bit further. They all come in differently. Or not go back, go forward, wherever you're going. Go, go, go ahead. Yeah, put all of them up there for me. Pull all, uh, okay. So here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand this progression here. When I look at this passage, what we need to understand is that this is more about God than Peter. That's what the scripture is indicating. This event is not pointing to Peter, it's pointing to God. And what it's pointing to God is about the message of God, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is our Redeemer, that Jesus is the rock of our salvation. Now, what Jesus says is, Peter, I'm building my church upon that, and I'm going to give you the keys, and what do the keys do? They open. I'm going to give you the keys to open the kingdom for people to come in. So what is the keys? It's the message that Jesus is the Christ that Jesus is our Redeemer, that Jesus is the rock of our salvation. That's the keys. That seems to make more sense because at this point in this event, this was more about Jesus than it was about Peter. It wasn't about exalting Peter. It was about exalting Christ and communicating the truth that Jesus is the Christ. And that is the message that opens the kingdom to all people. So Peter got the keys. He got the message. He received the message to open the kingdom to all people, and he did. Acts chapter 2, the very first gospel sermon ever preached, preached to thousands of Jews, 3,000 came into the kingdom that day. Acts chapter 10, Peter preaches the message of Jesus Christ to a Gentile by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius becomes saved that day and enters into the kingdom. And a little bit later on, Peter even used that example of Cornelius to communicate to all those in Jerusalem that the kingdom now was open to all Gentiles. Why? Because Peter had the keys. And the keys is the message that Jesus is our Redeemer. He's our Savior. He is our rock of salvation. Does that make sense to everybody? And so the keys given to a very ordinary man, was the message of Jesus Christ so that he might open the church to anyone and to everyone. But Peter was not the only one to receive the keys. Go back if you look, or or go take Matthew and go to chapter 18 of Matthew. And you might be asking the question, what does it mean to bind what's on earth and what's bound in heaven and that kind of stuff? Well, look, folks, it's very simply this. When you preach the gospel... The gospel being truth, we either bind someone or free someone. The gospel will either bind someone in their relationship to sin and self, or it will free them. You see, the gospel message communicates this truth. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and you have a choice to stay there if you want to. But the gospel message also shows that through the love of Jesus Christ, you can be freed and loose from that. It's the message that binds. It's not the individual. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, Jesus says this to the other apostles and the disciples. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you will loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Jesus just gave the keys of the kingdom to the apostles and to the disciples, and they used them greatly. Philip went into Samaria and preached the gospel and opened the door to the Samaritans. Peter and, I mean, I'm sorry, Paul and Barnabas went to Greece and Turkey and used the keys to open the kingdom to those there. Church history or church uh, tradition teaches us that Matthew went to Ethiopia and preached the gospel there and that Thomas went to India and opened the gospel doors. And so they used the keys that God gave them to open the church to anyone and to everyone. But there's someone else the keys have been given to you and I. We've received the keys that opens the kingdom to those around us. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed to us 
the message, there it is, the keys of reconciliation. You have the keys that can bring someone into a reconciled relationship, a restored relationship to the Father. We are therefore Christ's ambassador. What is that? We're his spokesperson. We're his representative. As though God was making this appeal through us, we employ you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We have the keys, folks. Every follower of Christ has the keys that opens the kingdom to those around us. It's the message of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, the most logical thing for me to say at this point is, are you using them? Or have you lost them? Or have you just set them aside? Or are they not important to you? The keys are what opens the kingdom. Now, what I thought I might do for a minute is actually go look at how these keys were used the very first time. Go to Acts chapter 2. Because Peter's gospel message here is remarkable. It's a beautiful message. It makes so sense. It makes so much sense. It flows unbelievably. It has one of the greatest outlines, preaching outlines you'll ever see. Throw the outline up there for me, Carla. It is an amazing outline of this message. And it is a message that still works today. The keys still work today. The message is still powerful today if we use it the way that we should. So let's walk through this message just for a minute. We understand the situation. It's Pentecost. There are thousands of people, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of Jews in the city of Jerusalem on this day. On this particular day, the disciples, the apostles are down in the city area and they begin to speak in tongues, which very simply means they were speaking a language they'd never studied before and it was being heard by the crowd. And they don't understand it because they look up and they know these guys and they say, these are uneducated people. How do they know this language without ever studying it? They must be drunk. Well, Peter grabs the keys and he stands up in verse 14 and he begins to unlock the door. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet of Joel. So his very first point is, this is that. That was Peter's point. I'm sure when he was putting this together the night before, he put it that way. This is that. What is happening now, what is happening right now, is what Joel prophesied about. That there would be a day when the end times would take place. And one of the signs of the end times is that people would be prophesying. This is the beginning of the end times. And the message is about Jesus. Because look at how he finishes this point out in verse 21. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's our keys. This is that. He then goes to the second point. Jesus is the Messiah. Verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by God, to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourself know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, meaning very simply, this was not an accident, folks. This did not catch God off guard. Jesus freely laid down his life for us. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So his second point is Jesus is the Messiah, and he breaks it down into subpoints. He says, first of all, let me show you that Jesus is the Messiah. God proved he was the Messiah. God, God provided the evidence to show that he was the Messiah. What evidence? The miracles he performed. And look, they saw these miracles. He performed one miracle where there was over 5,000 people at when he fed the 5,000 men. There might have been close to 20,000 there. When he raised Lazarus from the dead there in Bethany during the Passover, there were probably tens of thousands of people that passed through Bethany to get to Jerusalem. Many of them would have seen the miracle of the raising of Lazarus, but many more would have heard about it. These were not miracles that were done hidden off in a corner. They were all done in a public setting. They saw them. They, they saw, these weren't miracles that you say, hey, you're better, but you don't know if you're better. These are miracles that they saw happen right away. A man that couldn't walk could walk immediately. A man whose hand was shriveled up was now uh, 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 put back to, to uh, perfection. A man that couldn't see was given sight immediately. Even in the garden that night, 
when Peter cut off the ear of the high priest's servant and Jesus healed it, who saw it? All the Roman soldiers that were there that night to arrest him saw it. God proved that Jesus was Messiah. His second part of the point is that Jesus died. They knew that. Many of them would have been there just 50 days earlier during Passover and would have seen the crucifixion of Jesus. They knew he was dead. But see, that point just sets up the last point. He was raised from the dead. Now, he proves that Jesus was raised from the dead using three things. One, the fulfillment of prophecy. If you look, it's starting in verse, and I'm not going to read all this, but starting in verse 25, he talks about how David prophesied that the Messiah would not, his body would not see decay. And Peter said, look, we know he's not talking about himself because I can take you to David's tomb. He's talking about the Messiah. And Christ was raised from the dead. Well, how do we know that, Peter? Well, look, if you would, in verse 32. God has raised us, Jesus to life, and we all witness the fact. All the disciples standing before them had seen Jesus alive after he was dead. And they could call upon the 500, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Jesus had appeared to. And maybe some of them here were part of that 500. There were witnesses. But there was one more proof that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Look, if you would, at verse 33. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Folks, listen to me for a minute. One of the greatest things that testifies that Jesus Christ is alive is a changed life. It's a changed life. How does a dead Savior change somebody's life? And all throughout the Scriptures, we see people that were changed. But even in your own life. You see, this is a great, this is a great evangelism outline here. This is the message. This is the key. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. How do I know that? Because God sent him and he performed miracles and he died and people saw him die. And then he arose and people saw him arise. He fulfilled prophecy. And not only that, he changed his life. And you know what your greatest testimony is? Your life changed. Since you've known Christ, you don't speak the same way you speak. You don't use the same words or the same language. You have a different attitude. You love people differently. Your outlook is much more positive. You work harder because you've been changed by Christ. You see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit because one of the greatest testimonies of your message that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. I had a preacher one time uh, make the statement that, that if he could be at any event in the world, what he wanted to be at was the creation of Adam and Eve because he wanted to see new life begin. And then he stopped and said, you know what? I thought about that for a while sitting in my office and I realized I have. I've seen that. When someone accepts Christ, I've seen a new life begin. It's changed. And so he preaches the gospel. It's the same gospel today, folks. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, crucified, buried, and arose. But then Peter, and he could have been a car salesman because he knows how to close the deal. Look at verse 36. Therefore let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you, in the Greek, that word you is the emphasis. It is the first word of that sentence. You crucified both Lord and Christ. Man, that's a closing deal right there, folks. Because I want you to think about this a minute. They respond by saying that they were cut to the heart and they say, what must we do? Think about this for a minute. They are full of guilt. Why? For hundreds and hundreds of years, they have been waiting for the Messiah. They have sung about him. They have dreamed about him. They have spent their whole time looking for him. And now all of a sudden they're told, well, he was here, you killed him. The person you've been waiting for, you killed and they are crushed. Please understand this, church. We killed him too. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 says, He was pierced for my sins. You killed him too. I killed him too. This isn't about the Jews. It isn't about the Romans. It's about you and I. It's about those that you have relationships with 
that are looking, but they don't know what they're looking for. And you have the keys and you can open the door because the message is Jesus Christ died. You killed him, but he arose through the power of Christ and he saves. He saves. Now their reply is not just a reply of guilt, but it's a reply of belief as well. Look at what they say. What must we do? Now Peter's response is interesting. He does not say nothing. We don't have to do anything. Gosh, if he did something, that would be works. He doesn't say that. Why? Because please understand this truth. Obedience and works are not the same thing. Obedience is not inconsistent with faith and trusting God. How do I know? Because the Bible says so. Look at these scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Now that you've purified yourself by obeying the truth. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. If it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? Obedience and salvation go hand in hand because obedience is not works. And so they say, what must we do? It's a statement of belief. Listen, Peter, we believe you. Jesus was the Messiah. He was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we killed him. We believe that. What do we do? And look, his answer is not that confusing. It's not that complicated. Look what he says in verse 38. Repent and be baptized. That's what you do. By the way, both of those things are things that Jesus told them to preach. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus says, Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached to every man. Mark chapter 16, verse 16 says, Believe and be baptized and you will be saved. Those are both words from Jesus as to the message that is to be preached. So what must you do? Repent and be baptized. Let's review. Repentance is a change of the mind. It's saying, God, it's not about me anymore, it's about you. I don't want to chase after the things that make me happy that's, that the world says I need. I want to chase after you and the things you say I need. It is a turning 180 degrees, but it's a turning away from the world and what they say is important and you being king to turning to what God says is important and him being king. And then baptism is immersion. There's no way around that, folks. Biblically, that is the most soundest principle I could ever teach you. It is immersion. It is always immersion in Scripture. And not only that, but every well-known leader of any denomination states that same truth. Let me show you. The word baptize signifies to immerse. It is certain that immersion was the practice of the primitive church. John Calvin, Presbyterian. Buried within a baptism, alluding to the ancient manner of baptism, or baptizing by immersion, Wesley, Methodist Church. For 1,300 years was baptism and immersion of the person in the water, Brenner of the Catholic Church. And the list goes on and on and on. You see, this is one of those issues that we allow our preconceived ideas and our prejudice to keep God from revealing the truth to us, but that would offend my family. That would hurt my parents. That would cause my grandparents to mean that they were wrong. And all of a sudden, our preconceived idea is God is not allowed to reveal the truth to us. What must I do, Jesus? Repent and be immersed. It's not complicated. It's not confusing. It's not big words that Peter used. Can I say something to you, church? Just do it. Just do it. I love how we use that term all over the place. Just do it. That's Nike's term, isn't it? Isn't that the big redneck guy, get her done? That's the same thing as just do it. It's the same thing as just do it. Don't question it. Just open your eyes to what Peter says. And what did he say happens? You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and forgiveness of sin. You know what he just said? He says you become a new creation. You get a new life. New outlook, new purpose, new fulfillment, new family, new community. All those things become yours. You know what's interesting about this passage in Acts chapter 2? Who he's talking to. He's not talking to wicked people. He's not talking to the scum of the earth. He's talking to people that are searching on how to honor God. 
These are Jews that have come into town to worship God, but they're just, they're, they're looking, they're trying to find what, something's missing here. And the fact is, that could be some of you in this room. You don't have to be some wicked criminal or wicked person. It could be someone in here that just is searching, but you're not finding it yet. Everything you try just doesn't fulfill you. Nothing seems to bring the peace that you need in tough times. And you might do good things in your life. You might help people. You might be a great neighbor. But you've never really said, God, I want you to be king. I want you to be Lord. And I begin by submitting myself to you in immersion so that you know I'm serious about this. Some of you might be searching and it might be your answer. It's intriguing to me who he's talking to. So that would be part of the invitation this morning. For those of you that have come this far, but you need to go just a little bit further, the door's been opened. The message has been communicated. It's your opportunity now to respond to the message. But let me give you one more, con one more conclusion. There's a story told about a mother and father who named their child the very unusual name, Odd, O-D-D. -D. That was the boy's name. As you can imagine, he got ridiculed and blasted growing up, made fun of him completely. But all it did was cause him to resolve stronger and stronger to be the very best person he could ever be. So he went on to become a lawyer and a really good lawyer. Well, in time, he made a decision that when he died, he wanted to be buried with a headstone that had nothing on it at all because he never wanted that name to be mentioned again. He died, they buried him, they put a headstone up. The headstone was completely blank. The problem was is that when people would come along and they would see that headstone, almost all of them would say, that's odd. <laughs> I don't think it's a true story. <laughs> but let me tell you what I find intriguing about it. Jesus changed Peter's name. Peter's name was Simon. That, that's a simple name. Seven different Simons are mentioned in the gospel. It very simply means a hearer. Jesus comes along and he says, you're Peter. You're the rock. And everyone that knew Peter thought, that's the stupidest name you could give Peter. The last thing he is is stable and solid. He's emotional. He runs off at the mouth. He's always causing problems, and you're going to call him the rock. Why would Jesus do that? Because Jesus knew what Peter could be. He knew what Peter could become. And the same is true for each one of you in here. Maybe you don't feel like you have any great gifts, but God can still use you in extraordinary ways. He used a simple fisherman whose name was Simon to open the door to the first Jews and the first Gentiles into the kingdom. And he can use you. I don't know how and I don't know what, but I know he can use you in extraordinary ways if you will allow him to. If you will open up your life and say, God, use me. Whatever it is you want me to do, I'll do. Once he puts the name Christian on you, your name is changed now, which means, God, I want to be extraordinary for you. Can you make that a commitment? You should. So the conclusion is twofold. Some need to respond to the open door to the kingdom today. Some need to make a commitment to allow God to use you in a mighty way.